Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Spirit Side. I'm Paul James Caden, and today on the show we are going to revisit a topic of religion's struggle with the paranormal. I did a show on this subject uh, about a week ago, and I ended up uh, taking that show down because there were a couple of things that weren't exactly correct that I stated on there, and I don't like to leave shows out there floating around that might have misinformation or something that I was not uh, fully knowledgeable, knowledgeable about. But uh, we are revisiting this conversation because I think it's a very important one to have. I mean, let's face it, religion has always struggled with the notion of the paranormal. Some embrace it, some embrace parts of it, some try to tell us that it's all evil, that anything that's paranormal or otherworldly, even if it seems heavenly or friendly or positive or helpful, well, we should flee because it's likely a demon. There are also those who try to explain it away. We have many religions in the world and religious literature and books that downplay the paranormal and pretty much relegate it to being nothing but self-delusion, psychosis, superstitious thinking, and, you know, just something to be laughed at and scoffed because, well, it doesn't really happen. You know, God is in heaven and we are on earth, and uh, later maybe the two shall meet, but nowhere in between. But the interesting thing is, and if you've listened to my shows for any amount of time, you know that I've done a lot of years, probably 30 plus years by now, of various in-depth studies of comparative religion, science and religion, history and religion, parapsychology, ufology, I mean, you name it, all things that are interesting and spiritual and unexplained. I've uh, delved into it, the near-death experience. I've invested uh, many years in studying, and I still look into that phenomenon because there's new data coming out all the time. We have institutes and doctors and real scientists, you know, working in these institutes that dedicate their time to nothing more than studying the near-death experience because they are absolutely convinced based on the data that they have that this is not just the phenomenon of a dying brain. There's something else going on here, something that is real. And I say all that, you know, not to, you know, be one of these braggart people. Oh, you know, I've studied all these great things. Hey, there's a lot that I don't know. And when it comes to these studies, um, there's a lot I do know. There's a lot I don't. And I'm probably uh, rather stupid <laughs> you know, and uneducated uh, when it comes to some aspects uh, of all of these subjects. But... Uh, the thing of it is, when you really delve into these uh, these topics, these subjects, these strange phenomenon, you really do start to get this idea that there's something going on out there in our world and in our universe that we're completely unaware of, that we can't explain nor do our religions adequately explain it. And it becomes quite difficult at that point to even take seriously the people who laugh and scoff and call these things woo-woo and, you know, magical thinking and, you know, superstition and all that type of thing. Because these are individuals who as I've said many times in my shows, are either completely unaware of the research that's been done, the data that has come in over, you know, years, the experiences people have had, sane people, people that were not even religious or superstitious in the least. They're either completely unaware of all of this 
or they've heard it and just chose to be fundamentalist in their scientific beliefs and say, oh, I, I can't believe that. And that does happen. As much as it happens in religion, where a person is handed a certain group of beliefs and told this is the truth, and the individual will take those beliefs, will take those doctrines, will take those dogmas, and you will be very hard-pressed to get them to believe anything that is contrary to it, because in their world, it just can't be. So it either has to be a lie, it has to be self-delusion, it has to be woo-woo, or it has to be something that is evil and deceptive, and never should we revisit this subject, talk about it, or get involved with it in any way, shape, or form. But again, that's just being uh, spiritually and I think intellectually dishonest with ourselves. It's too easy to step back and say, oh, you know, ghosts and spirits and UFOs and angels and things unexplained. Yeah, those were the beliefs of the caveman, but we're, we're so civilized and educated today, you know, that we know these things can't possibly be. Well, again, I think we have to look at the data. I think we have to look uh, at the many people that have had unexplained experiences just out of the blue. And for the religious folks there, out there, I, I usually always, when they start with, well, none of that exists, well, you know, all of that is evil, I usually point to the fact of the story of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in the Bible, where he spoke to uh, Moses and Elijah during the transformation when his garments lit up like, you know, lightning. And some people will say, well, you know, Elijah was taken away in a chariot of fire, you know, so he didn't die. He was alive in heaven. Well, what about Moses? He was long dead and gone. What about all the times that it said angels came and ministered and cared for Christ? And people will usually say, well, that's different. Well, how is it different? Jesus interacted with what we call the spirit world or the world of the supernatural or the paranormal and yet he turned around and said, the things that I do will you do also if you believe. So where is the confusion in all of that? If we read the Bible, if we're religious people and we see Jesus and the apostles all throughout the book, Old Testament, New Testament, how many times people encountered angels and saw visions and things happened like when the apostle paul was in prison and it said that an angel came in the night and opened the prison door and you know they could have walked right out you know but yet we want to tuck these things away and say well it doesn't exist in our day it doesn't happen in our day but it does if one does a study alone on angelic visitations and angelic encounters. You will find thousands upon thousands or actually millions upon millions of people worldwide who claim that in a time of crisis or illness or maybe one of their loved ones had a terminal disease or was in an accident and not expected to make it. How many of these people say that as they were praying, as they were sitting in their loved one's hospital room or in the hospital room in the hospital bed themselves, this being of light appeared and sometimes had a message 
or sometimes said not a word at all, but the person understood why that being was there, and suddenly everything changed. Now we can look at that and say, well, that's woo-woo, but what about the story on the news about, I want to say it was probably about a year and a half ago, where it was caught on the hospital camera that it looked like an angel, a being of light, standing outside of a patient's room in the ICU. And that person miraculously recovered from whatever it was that uh, had happened to them. And I don't think that person, uh, I don't think their odds were very good for living or pulling through. And they could go back and look at the tape and see that there was nothing there. Then here was this glowing object that looked like an angel with wings, and then it was not there. So how do we explain these things? Is it woo-woo? Is it superstition? How does religion and non-belief explain that Individuals, paranormal investigators, can go into a home or a piece of property with scientific equipment and record voices and pick up different heat signatures, hear things, see things, equipment registering things that the human eye doesn't see, the human ear doesn't hear. And how many times have there been professors from universities that showed up on these paranormal investigations and came back saying, yes, something went on there. I didn't believe this at first, but now I do. Because the equipment doesn't lie. The evidence does not deceive. Something happened there. But yet we make believe None of this happens. We try to explain it away. Or how about the near-death experience? What about the phenomenon during the NDE where the person says they're out of their body and they leave the room and they see something that is happening in the hallway of the hospital? Or they find themselves in the home of their relatives and see what their relatives were doing while they were on the operating table getting emergency surgery. They were in the home when the call came that your loved one's in emergency surgery, you might want to come now because we're not sure they're going to make it. And the disembodied person, the consciousness of the person whose body is in the emergency surgery in the operating room, but the consciousness is in the house of his brother-in-law, sees his brother-in-law eating a ham sandwich, reading the paper. The wife is on the phone talking to Aunt Sally, and then, you know, the another call comes in from the hospital, and they scramble, and, you know, the brother-in-law drops his ham sandwich on the floor in his haste to get out of the house and rush to the hospital doesn't stop to clean it up, but yet the consciousness of the person or the spirit of the person, we'll say, who's in the house seeing all this explains it to a T. But then later that person wakes up from the operation. They live, they explain what they saw. Nobody knows how they knew laying on the operating table, flatlining, what was happening at their brother-in-law's house at that very minute, but yet they do. And religion ignores this or says it's a deception of the devil. Science and its dogmatic pronouncements won't even comment on these things, not the last that I've heard. They're satisfied with saying, well, it's just the phenomenon of a dying brain. They don't want to know anything else because it's outside of their realm of understanding and belief and what they want to believe. And now what about the subject of UFOs? I mean, this is certainly something that 
fits the category of the paranormal or the unexplained. And now these things are suddenly everywhere. Fighter pilots, Navy ships, recording them coming in and out of the ocean, tracking our planes, flying around. There one minute, gone the next, taking off and traveling at great speeds that our technology has no way of doing. But yet we still have people who will sit back and laugh and pull out the little green man card because, oh, isn't that funny? Ha ha ha, Martians. But let's dig a little bit deeper into this. We don't know where these things are from. Are they from another planet? Some very educated people who research this speculate they're from other dimensions of reality. Others say that they may be right under our feet in our oceans because so many of them are seen over the ocean, entering the ocean, coming out of the ocean. How do we explain that? The universe is definitely much more mysterious. The world we live in, this planet is much more mysterious than we ever stop to really think about. And then you have people who witness these cryptids that they call Bigfoot, Mothman. I was watching uh, something on YouTube the other day where an individual shares a lot of true paranormal stories. And uh, he was sharing a lot of uh, different accounts where people saw these what he calls fire spirits. They look like men or women engulfed in flame. But yet, when they got close, there was no heat emanating from the fire. These things flew, these things just appeared and disappeared. All kinds of strange phenomenon out there. Sometimes witnessed by one person, sometimes witnessed by a whole town, a whole group of people, a whole neighborhood. But yet this is woo-woo, yet this is something that's not supposed to happen. The religions that go out of their way to tell us, well, no, it must have been something else. Because there's no such things as spirits. Angels don't interact with human beings. God doesn't interact with human beings on that kind of particular level. So it had to be something else or a self-delusion. I think the self-delusion argument in and of itself is a self-delusion trying to convince ourselves that these things are not real, that there's not phenomenon that happens in our world and in our universe that we can't explain, we can't grasp, we can't make it fit in to our pet religious doctrines. What do we do with this? Jesus never said anything about this. Buddha never said anything about this. Muhammad never said anything about this. The best we can get there are, you know, demons and the jinn or, you know, whatever the case may be. So everything must be demons or the jinn. But not everything fits that bill either. Because there are accounts of spirits appearing to people that literally save their lives, help them, or even guided them back to faith in God or a Christian faith that they abandoned. And these guiding helpful spirits were sometimes radiant beings of light that were described as angels. Sometimes they were complete strangers, so again the person assumes that it was an angel or a heavenly messenger, and sometimes they were deceased relatives. 
appearing to a person, sometimes with a message, many times just appearing, and there's a knowing about what that apparition, what that spirit is imparting to the person it is visiting. So if talking to the spirits of the dead and ghosts are all delusions or evil spirits, why are they helping people? Why are they guiding people back to faith in God? See, that doesn't, that doesn't fit the MO. That doesn't fit the lens in which we see these things through. If something is evil, if something is deceptive, why is it bringing someone back to God and then just leaving them alone? And now the person goes to church every Sunday, reads their Bible every day, they pray, they tithe, they help the poor, whatever it is they do, however it is, they change their lives in a spiritual or religious aspect drawing closer to God. So see, the blanket statement doesn't work that it's all jinn or it's all demons or it's all these dangerous, deceptive spirits. Well, that doesn't make sense. But yet people don't want to hear that. And, you know, if you tell them these things or share accounts with them of, of this phenomenon happen or happening, they'll pause for a moment, but then say, well, I don't know, but I still think it's evil. Because that's what they're supposed to believe. That's what they've been told they have to believe. And these are just some of the ways in which religion struggles with the paranormal and the unexplained. And this is why there are some people who, when they venture into this territory or have an experience themselves, and it starts them searching, what was this? What did it mean? Why did this happen? Some of these individuals end up leaving their religion. Because religion is so close-minded when it comes to these things. No, that never happened. Are you sure? It was a dream. You deceived yourself. It was the devil. It was a demon. And the person who experienced it knows full well that it was none of these things. And so if the explanations are inadequate, well, they will go search for answers somewhere else. Because you see, when it comes to the paranormal, people aren't as ignorant or stupid or self-deceived as most individuals would like to believe they are. They know what they've experienced. They know what they've seen. They can't explain it. It was more than just a passing apparition out of the corner of their eye that they thought they saw something. And it affected their lives, and they want answers. They need answers. To some people, it's frightening. To some people, it's freeing. Because they've had an experience that tells them there's more to life and the life after and more to religion and spirituality than we're handed in this limited little world that we currently live in. I shared this story uh, years ago when I first started podcasting where I saw something. I was driving in, in the car uh, with a friend. My friend was driving. We were headed to the computer store. It was uh, a February night. It was dark. It was moonless. And as we were driving, there was a shimmering light on some trees on the side of the road. And as we neared the trees, the shimmering light came off the trees, crossed the road, passed right over the hood of our car, and disappeared on the edge of a field on the, on the opposite side of the road. 
this wasn't something that happened in a split second. It was, you know, at least a good half minute or more of seeing this object cross the road. And people can say I'm crazy. People can disbelieve it. But what it was was a being shaped like a man with large triangular wings coming out of its back. And it was completely made of light. Some would say, well, it was an angel. It had wings. I don't know what it was. But it lit up the whole interior of the car on a dark, moonless February night with a bright blue-white light as it passed right over the hood of our car in front of the windshield. We both got a very good look at what this was. And I've shared that that uh, story with some people, and there are some people who were not even there, and they said, well, both of you were mistaken. It was just a big bird that was caught in your headlights. No, it wasn't a bird. It went right over the hood of our car. We got a very good look at it, coming across the road, going across the hood of our car, and then to the other side of the road where it disappeared. There was no mistaking my friend gasped and said, holy, expl- you know, holy blank, <laughs> holy expletive. <laughs> and uh, I certainly knew at that time about uh, mass hallucination or witnesses influencing one another. And I just told her, I said, don't say a word. Whatever you just saw, don't even say a word. Until I got the story straight in my mind, what I saw. Then I asked her, okay, what did you see? Why did you gasp? Why did you slam on the brake? Why were you looking shocked? And she related to me the same thing. Exact same thing, to the T. We both saw it. It wasn't a bird, yet people who were not there will say, it was just a big bird. Whatever it was doing out at night, it got caught in your headlights and you you thought it was something else. But this is how we explain it away. This is how people's mind work. There there has to be something else, that reasonable explanation. And many times there are. You know, we have to be reasonable. We have to be logical. We have to be scientific about the paranormal. We just can't, uh, as I've heard it said, there are some people who see a 747 flying in the sky and they'll swear it's a UFO because they want it to be a UFO. You know, we can't, we can't be dramatic and um, fanatical about those things either. And some people are. Any little thing they see, oh, that was a spirit. Oh, that was an angel. Oh, that was my spirit guides. Oh, you know, I had this experience. And that just muddies the water for honest research and real phenomenon and honest experiences. But those real phenomenon and honest experiences are out there. And now at the very tail end of this podcast, let's give notable mention to quantum mechanics that is now talking more and more every day about parallel universes, other dimensions, the God concept, speculating that the cosmos itself may have a consciousness or Is that consciousness in the cosmos what we call God? And God is permeating all things in his creation. Well, isn't that weird that now scientists are beginning to talk a little bit about this woo-woo and admitting science is now just beginning to catch up what the mystics have known for centuries. So I think it really is a time in our existence as a race where we have to start thinking a little bit more reasonable and scientific about these things. I think it's time to stop struggling with it. I think it's time to stop trying to explain it away. I think it's time to stop Uh, ignoring it because it doesn't fit what we want to believe. 
hey, if we're all looking for the truth, whether that truth is spiritual or scientific, we need to be open-minded and we need to accept things as they are, not the way we want them to be. Because that's not being honest about the subject and that's not being honest with ourselves. And maybe, just maybe, if we can, our, if we can open our minds and think a little bit more broadly about these subjects and understand this world and this universe is a lot bigger, a lot more mysterious, a lot more wonderful than we're even allowing ourselves to admit. Maybe this is when men will have peace. They will come together in their religions. They will come together in their politics. They will come together as brothers and sisters instead of races and nations and classes. And we'll begin to realize that this material world isn't all there is. And we're like babies playing in the sandbox with our money and our cars and our homes and our egos and, you know, our economies and our governments and our political parties and all these stupid little insignificant things that we put such importance upon. And then we let those things divide us and make us hate others and get into stupid things like racism, hating other people because of the color of their skin or what country they're from, what culture they're from. Maybe then we'll begin to open up our eyes and say, geez, maybe we better start thinking a little bit differently and acting a little bit more differently toward one another. Because pardon my French ladies and gentlemen, but maybe we'll be able to look at this world and say, you know what, this little bullshit that we play around with every day and we think is so damn important is really nothing. It's all temporary. And one way or another, whether it's the day we die or some cosmic event that changes everything, all of this is going to change. All of this is inevitably going to go away. And maybe it's more important that we start focusing on higher ideals rather than playing, playing around in the uh, litter box, you know, slinging uh, litter-covered cat turds at one another. <laughs> but I have a very colorful way of uh, wrapping up this show with the moral of the story, but, <laughs> you know, it fits. Because, you know, the stuff we think is important is just so ridiculous sometimes. And maybe it's time to start struggling, to stop struggling with the paranormal and the unexplained and start embracing it a little more and asking ourselves, if this stuff is real, then what does it mean? I thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. Until next time, stay safe, stay well, stay open-minded, and I will talk to you next time here on The Spirit Side.